Welcome to the shop for episode 6 of How to Build a Fiddle. In our last video, we hollowed out our plates, we thicknessed them, and then we did some plate tuning to get the resonant frequencies of the two plates in a good relationship. Well, things are starting to get pretty exciting because we're getting close to assembling the corpus or the body of our fiddle. There are a few tasks that we need to accomplish first and they primarily involve the belly or top plate. The first step is to install our F holes. You can get the outline or template for your F holes from a variety of sources. Maybe you bought plans online. Maybe you're working off a Strad poster. The Strad poster has a nice outline of the F holes on back. Word of caution that that is a diagram of the actual F holes as carved by the original maker, so they're not exactly symmetrical. I've actually, in one case, made a rubbing off of a violin that had F holes that I liked and I made a template out of a piece of cardstock and that works just fine. You can buy a pre-made template, metal or plastic, they all work terrific. Now the big question is where on earth do we stick these things? Does it really matter where we stick our F holes or are we just going for good looks? Well it turns out it does matter the first thing we must consider is the vertical center of our F holes noted by these little nicks, one here and one here. We locate these at what is called the stop length, which is measured from the top of our plate down 195 millimeters, and that locates our bridge for us. The second thing to consider is that in the center of our fiddle plate there's an imaginary bridge that connects the upper bout from the lower bout. As the strings are bowed the bridge excites the top and vibrations travel through the feet. We need the F holes far enough apart so as not to obstruct these vibrations. So now we draw a little map on our top to locate our F holes. Whenever you make pencil marks on your fiddle top, do it lightly so you can remove them. You need to find your center line and you're going to want to strike a little pencil line right in the middle to work off of. Then you're going to measure your stop length from the top of the plate down 195 millimeters and make a perpendicular line. A piece of cardstock works well for doing this. Then you're going to measure up 30 millimeters and make a very light line and measure out 21 millimeters on either side of the center. These two marks are the minimum clearance we need to allow the vibrations from our bridge to travel freely. This is our stop length. We place the little nick on our F hole on the stop length and then we can rotate this a little bit until the top of our F hole touches that 21 millimeter line. Here's how my F hole works out. I set my lower eye 15 millimeters from the C bout. In no case should yours be less than 11. Then I make a complementary 15 millimeter mark here to aid me in locating the F hole on this side. Now that you've got your F holes all marked out, it's time for a tool alert. Now remember when you were a kid and it was time for the Pinewood Derby and somebody handed you a block of wood and one of these things and then you spent a month trying to make like two four inch cuts in that little block and you never wanted to see this again? Well, it's time to get another coping saw. The other thing you're going to need, two drill bits that look like this. See the little point in the center? Quarter inch and five sixteenths work great for this Guaneri scroll. There are many ways you can cut out your F hole 
but I use the quarter inch drill bit up here and the 5 16 drill bit down here. I center the drill bit on the eye and I rotate it backwards by hand to cut that line. The other way I've done this is I've taken an eighth inch drill bit and drilled a series of holes here and then one in each eye and I've done the entire thing with just my X-Acto knife and that works just fine. There's one other tool I want to mention. If you use the coping saw to cut the F holes you really need to support the plate well. You can make a nice cutting table out of some scraps of wood, cut a keyhole in one end, drop it in your vise, and you have a great place to cut the F holes. I keep the bit perpendicular to the arch. Just have to be very careful as you go. Very, very careful. Now I'm going forward just a little bit, backwards. Or you can just hold the bit in your hand. You don't want it to chip out. Once it pokes through the back, I'll do the same thing and go in reverse. Just enough to make sure it doesn't chip out. Always finish from the top. There. Nice clean hole. Now that you got your holes all cut, it's time to pull out the old coping saw. You want to install the blade so the teeth are oriented downward so that as we cut, we're cutting on the down stroke. We do not want to chip the top here. And yes, it's a pain, but you have to detach the blade insert it through the hole, reattach it, and then tighten it up a little bit. This is all I do. It doesn't really take much, and then I can get my blade in there, and that carves out real easy. This little wing right here is very fragile. I suggest you clean this up right here, while this meat is still here, then carefully score and work your way away from the eye right here. Now, if something goes crazy and you get a little chip right here, hold everything, get the super glow, it'll be okay. One of the very best pieces of luthery advice I ever got was from the master luthier, Al Carruth. And I was asking him, about what was the secret to making really great F-holes. And he turned and looked at me and he said, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Well, that's close enough for now. We'll get in there with some little files and clean that up. Now here, we have to be very careful to observe the direction of the grain as we carve out this part. I worked my way down one side, now I'm gonna turn around and come back on this side. Now that you're almost done, take a break. Step back a little bit and take a look at it. This is your F hole and you want it to have a little style. All right, so you can make some small corrections. Another thing you need to do is take out your caliper and measure the center width of the F hole. It needs to be six and a half to seven millimeters wide or you'll never get your sound post in. I got the F holes all finished, but there's something missing. And can you guess what it is? I got so caught up in prepping to show you how to do the F holes, I didn't talk about fluting the lower wing of the F holes. And it really is best to do it, I think, before you cut the F holes out. But I'm going to go ahead and flute those now, and you can see what it is I'm talking about. The fluting on the lower wing of the F-hole is just a decorative relief. It has nothing to do with the sound. It just looks real pretty. So I'm using my three-quarter inch gouge here, which doesn't feel sharp enough right at the moment. 
And the idea is to put a little relief here and then feather it in with the scraper. I'm really sorry for getting this out of order. I mean, it's not the end of the world, but I meant to try to really keep myself on track. No fluting. Watch the highlights on the edge of the F hole. Fluted. See how pretty that is? Well, now that we've recovered from my oversight, sorry about that, the next step is to look at installing our base bar. So the first thing we have to do is a little bit more math, and then we'll make some marks on here. Now remember, we're looking at this upside down, so the base bar is on the right, the sound post eventually will be on our left. The first mark we want to make 40 millimeters down from the top, make a line perpendicular to the center line. Also, 40 millimeters up from the bottom, make a line perpendicular to the center line. This mark and this mark is the length and position of your base bar. Now we need to locate the base bar horizontally. So here's where the math comes in. Remember when we divided the length by the number 14 to hollow out our back plate? Well the number 14 comes in handy again. You need to measure the width of your upper bout at its widest point and the width of your lower bout at its widest point. Jot those two numbers down divide each of them by the number 14 and that will give you the distance from the center line to the inside edge of the base bar and then mark accordingly here and here. On this plate that ended up being 12 millimeters at the top and 15 millimeters out at the bottom. In the center of our plate, we've made a line perpendicular to the center line 195 millimeters down from the top. Remember, that's our stop length. Measure from the center over 21 millimeters and give yourself a little line. This is going to locate the future sound post. From the center line, come over this way 19 millimeters. This will be the outside edge of the base bar. The base bar is going to line up just like this and you can see our marks. Well this step in the process brings us to a tool alert. There are a few things you're going to need to accomplish this task. The first thing is something all luthiers rely on. It's a specialized tool that looks like this. We're going to use this washer and roll it along the belly plate and scribe our line on our base bar to help us fit it. You're also going to need a piece of chalk because we're going to chalk fit the base bar. And once it is fit and we apply glue, we need to clamp it. It's a long way from here to here and we need to be gentle and apply firm pressure without damaging the top. This is called a cam clamp. Works like this. And this is a fun project. I made a half a dozen of these out of some scrap oak from a pallet and a piece of steel from Tractor Supply. There's some nice videos on YouTube. Maybe you should make yourself a set. Well, let's get started with installing the base bar. This is a piece of spruce left over from cutting the belly plate. Notice the grain is vertical and my base bar is 5.5 millimeters thick. This piece is 15 millimeters tall, but the height right now doesn't matter so much as long as you have enough to work with. 
I scooch all the rice to one side on my fiddle pillow to kind of angle my plate this way. Then I'm going to put my base bar in position and notice the little marks on the base bar. It's very easy to get turned around later on. I mark bottom and top and a directional arrow. All right, grab your specialized Luthier's only washer. Okay, and scribe your line for your preliminary cut on your base bar. Because this is a very complex curve, I like to scribe a line on both sides of my base bar to aid with the carving. Notice how on the F-hole side more wood must be removed. So now we just plane this down until we get to our lines. Now that we have the base bar close to fitting right, we're going to take our chalk and give ourselves a nice line of chalk right down here. Okay, now we put our base bar back in position exactly where it was. And we're going to wiggle it just a tiny bit. We pick it up and we look at where the chalk touched. Here, here, and little dot there. So we scrape those areas and then repeat and repeat until it fits perfect. Once you have an even distribution of chalk, on the bottom edge. You know you're about done and the last thing you need to check is make sure the base bar is as close to 90 degrees with the top as you can get it. Before we actually glue our base bar into position it would be a good idea to give ourselves some parameters for the final shape of the base bar. Make a mark here at the future bridge position. Measure the length of the entire base bar and make a mark at the exact center. Measure from the center forward and divide that number by 3, placing a mark at each location. From the bridge position backwards, measure that and divide it by 3 as well and give yourself a mark. At the bridge position in the center line, Make a mark at 13 millimeters from the bottom in both locations. And then here, 10 millimeters up from the bottom, 5 up from the bottom, 3 up. Also, 10 up from the bottom, 5 up, and 3 up. And you may connect your lines if you like, and we'll use that as a guide to shape our base bar. To prepare for gluing, take your small plane and chamfer the top two corners so there's less chance of your clamps knocking this out of whack. Add my glue warming up. Now I'm going to apply a generous coat of glue quickly to the bottom of the base bar. I'm probably making a huge mess. All right, quickly get it into position the right direction, right on the marks, and then gently wiggle it back and forth, applying firm pressure. Watch your marks. It's easy to get off. Firm pressure, small wiggles, gets the air out, and we hold. The glue starts to set up a little bit, and then that will give us time to put our clamps on. All right, there we go. Clamped in place, now we gotta let her dry. While the glue is like jello, you can clean it up real nice. Hello, plate tuning fans. It's pouring rain out there. Bet you can hear it. I got the clamps off. Our base bar is glued in place. Next step is to plane this down close to our marks. Then I'm going to stop and I'm going to check the resonant frequency of this on the Audacity software on the computer. As we plane the base bar down, the frequency that this resonates at is going to drop. 
I want to get within five or six hertz of my original tune. Word of caution to you who are trying this. As you plane this bar down, the frequency will go down to a point, and then it will stop. And you can keep shaving away at this bass bar, and it's not going to go any lower. And what will happen is, when you assemble your fiddle, you're going to end up with a weak sounding fiddle and quite possibly a terrible wolf tone. Been there, done that. Okay? So go slow and follow along with me. Just using my trusty thumb plane, I'm going to bring the bar down to the 13 millimeter height. Our finished height will most likely be about 12. We don't want to go any lower than that. Now we're close, so I'm going to finish the ends, and I'll show you that. And then we're going to taper this and round the top, and then we'll test it. Very carefully use your small chisel, very carefully. And you're kind of putting, a, let's say, a 50 degree angle on the end of this, taper it down to nothing. Just don't stab it into your plate. Now let's use our little thumb plane again. Go along the side, on both sides, and let's start to round this top over for now. Here's a good preliminary shape. Now we'll check it on the computer. Before we cut the F-holes and installed the base bar, we had a mode 5 of 357. So now we'll test it with the base bar. Here we go. And we'll analyze it. Mode 5 is at 358. Can't ask for better than that. In fact, that's actually never happened to me where I came right out of the box with the right frequency. Man, I am just blown away. I've never hit it right on the button like that. This is what it looks like. Now you know you want to see what it looks like on the speaker, don't you? All right, here we go. 358, hopefully. There. Look at that visual. Do you remember the first time we tested this plate? Remember this guy? Yeah, same plate. See how this node runs off the edge and this node runs off the edge? That's a good thing. If we saw this curl around in here or in here, that would tell us we had not thickness the plate properly. This Cladney pattern looks good. Remember the goal for tuning our plates? We want to be a semitone apart. Now I know now that I need to take my back plate and scrape a little here and a little down here and drop this frequency a couple of hertz. And then we'll be there half tone apart and we can finish our edges and assemble our corpus and we'll do that in the next video. So I'll see you there. Bye for now. It's the old locust wood fiddle. It's good accompaniment, I guess.